Istanbul is probably the oldest city in the world, and it's the only city that straddles two continents. The Bosphorus runs between Europe and Asia and gives Istanbul its unique character. People have lived here for 2,700 years. It was the capital of the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, and the Ottoman Empire. The city was always cosmopolitan, as Byzantium, Constantinople, and Istanbul, the name officially adopted in 1930. Its location at the seam of two continents, between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean, and between different worlds, has made Istanbul a center for trade, transport, and commerce. People on both sides of the Bosphorus say all roads lead to Istanbul, and that has left its mark on the city. Istanbul is a city, is an extremely dispersed city, and uh, you can see uh, you can see a difference of way of living um, in, in in two neighborhoods. Uh, side by side. Two ways of living, uh, totally different. Then this is what makes Istanbul really wonderful. Istanbul is the third largest city in the world. 13 million people live within the city limits and the same number again in the surrounding area. Those are the official figures, but there are probably a couple of million more people here illegally. The metro area is growing all the time, spreading across the hilly terrain. It already measures 100 kilometers by 50. Istanbul lies at the boundary between the Eurasian and the Anatolian tectonic plates, which means another major earthquake is just a question of time. Only a small fraction of the city's houses are built to withstand. Almost 90% of the population were born somewhere else, most come from poor areas of Anatolia or the Black Sea coast. Istanbul is uh, still uh, receiving uh, a, a fair amount of immigration every year. And um, it used to be that when it was uh, a growing city uh, in the 1980s and uh, earlier, um, there was a, a more comfortable accommodation for these new immigrants. There was land so that they could, in fact, squat and build their illegal houses. And there were uh, jobs that they could uh, take uh, because these jobs were basically informal and uh, unskilled uh, jobs. Um, now, however, Istanbul has become much more of a first world city in many respects. It is a global city. The kind of employment that you can find in Istanbul are perhaps less the third world uh, megacity type employment and more closer to the first world type employment. Nur Tepe is a neighborhood that's home to many people from Anatolia. It's a world of its own. Few here have anything to do with big city life. For the past two years, women have been gathering every day in a building that belongs to the local authority. Women who until then had rarely ventured outside their homes. Here they work making things they can sell, they talk, and they learn. We as a group thought about what we should do. We've all come from somewhere else. We don't know the area. 
We don't know what kind of work we could do. Our husbands won't let us take any jobs in parts of the city where we don't know anyone and that we'd have to get to by car. I had a job, but then I lost it. My neighbour too. She had a small baby. But places at a kindergarten were really expensive. And about that time, we heard there was an association that trains women to look after children here in the neighborhood. That's how the project began. It gives the women a reason to leave the house for a few hours. When we were new here, it was really tough. Conditions were terrible. The women had no self-confidence. They couldn't go out or look around. But thanks to this association, they're more confident now. They're developing and learning new things, also about how to bring up their children, how to deal with their husbands, and how to express themselves. Many women who come here find it hard to talk openly. They've suffered domestic violence and live really very difficult lives. At the moment, they're making sachets of lavender for sale. They'll share the proceeds. In the other room, young women are learning how to use computers. Every month they study something different. They usually teach each other. We received instruction at another association, and we're passing on what we learnt there. Every September, we draw up a plan of what we're going to learn and what we're going to teach. For example, management skills. Then in October, how to look after children. In November, domestic violence. Care, leadership, dealing with violence, respect for diversity, computers. These are topics we study and then teach here later. Upstairs, there's a daycare centre for children. It's also run by the women of Nortepe. They're determined to teach the young things that will help them have a better future. So it is a multi-purpose project and if it were replicated in neighborhoods where there are women who are otherwise confined to the house, uh, it would in fact serve a, a, a very important purpose. This modest project is exceptional. It's changing these women's lives. They say a year ago they would never have considered looking a male visitor in the eyes. Most of the buildings in Istanbul were put up without proper architectural plans and without an official permit. The city is growing in chaotic fashion. Heavy rains often wash away entire streets. The oldest continuously inhabited city has not been built for eternity. More than a quarter of the city's population live in illegally built homes. I would like to show them and prepare a guidebook kind of guidebook to show them that spending the same amount of money using the same materials, the same components they, uh, they are using actually, they can achieve a totally different 
better buildings. Yeah, that, that's really my dream. But the city government has other ideas. It wants to pack as many people as possible into as small an area as possible. And the residents of illegal settlements are also voters. The State Housing Construction Agency alone completes more than 150 new apartments a day. There's no time for urban planning or infrastructure development. At the same time, close by, gated communities are springing up for the new business and financial elites. They don't have roots in the city and don't share its traditions. They create their own little islands, luxurious, spacious retreats with guards at the gate, helicopter landing pads and leisure facilities. These communities are the antithesis of efforts at social integration in the city. When the sun goes down, the heart of Istanbul feels like a big western city. It has it all. The great diversity of city life has attracted ever more tourists in recent years. That's unusual for a rapidly growing mega city. The nightlife obscures for a few hours the problems of the inner city, homelessness, drug abuse and crime. I think this is something that uh, people don't recognize, that uh, the uh, modern economy of the 21st century is one that uh, favors uh, women. Uh, it is mostly services, um, men who do unskilled work in factories are no longer needed. Um, most service sector uh, jobs are women's jobs and, uh, uh, and, and, and men's unemployment uh, has been increasing. Um, so uh, in fact, uh, young men are more vulnerable uh, than most of the other categories in the society, perhaps the most vulnerable uh, group in the society. Right beside the highway to the airport, on a patch of open ground between a prison, a hospital and a new shopping centre, there's a place of refuge for people who can't find their place in modern-day Istanbul. Young men who are too old for state aid programmes for children or for admission to an orphanage and who have no home to go to. They can stay here for weeks, months or even years. Gurkhan came to Istanbul alone, sent away from home by his parents to earn some money. After months of living on the streets, he came here. With a few others, he puts out a homeless magazine. Proceeds help support the project. Gurkhan does the illustrations. His main theme is the relationship between Istanbul and its people. Many people don't like Istanbul. They say, it's a huge ocean, and if you fall in, you drown. You need to be really tough. But I say, as long as people leave their homes and come streaming into the city to find work, you shouldn't blame Istanbul. The city provided the land for the project and pays for the food. All other expenses are covered by donations or by selling the magazine. Once a month, they hold a special dinner. Gyros with vegetables, grilled on an open fire. Ferhat has been here a long time, and he's the chef on these occasions. I came here after I got out of jail. This was the only youth center I could go to. I was 18 and too old for all the others. I also spent time sleeping rough. 
On the streets, we were rejected and scorned by the police, our families, society. Here, we're a community. We don't scorn or reject each other, and we try to get some education. There are classes in reading, writing and arithmetic. But perhaps the most important thing the young men learn here are a sense of responsibility and mutual respect. The most obvious advantage of being here is having a roof over their heads, clean accommodation and a bathroom. For most of the 20 or so residents, these are the most comfortable quarters they've ever lived in. The project was the brainchild of one man, Yusuf. Like most of the others here, he too came to Istanbul to find his fortune. Now he's a social worker, manager and role model. We were three brothers and we lived in a children's home. I spent 12 years there. I graduated from high school but didn't get into university. When I turned 18 I had to leave the home. I spent three years on the streets. Now I'm a journalist and teacher. I founded the association that runs this place and I have a family. The point is, I know what it's like. I've been through these things myself. I know under what difficult conditions many children grow up. And I'm convinced that if you take them by the hand, treat them with respect and with love, and if you have trust in them, they will one day be able to do a lot for their country, themselves, their families and the world around them. That's why I'm doing this. I've been working in this field for 24 years and I'm still committed to this vision. I haven't lost my enthusiasm or my faith. The Bosphorus is the strait that connects the Sea of Marmara and the Black Sea and that divides Europe and Asia. It's one of the world's busiest waterways. Huge ocean-going vessels pass down the strait and countless smaller ferry boats cross it, carrying commuters from one continent to the other. 65% of Istanbul's residents live on the European side, 35% on the Asian side. Many travel back and forth several times a day. Boats are often the best and fastest way to get around. The layout of the city, which dates back to the Ottoman era, is not well suited to the traffic of a teeming metropolis. There's no comprehensive integrated public transport network, but a disparate set of bus and tram routes and subway lines. The most common means of transport are dolmush or shared taxis. Passengers have to wait until the minibus is full. Taksim is the downtown business district. Since markets were liberalized in 1980, the Turkish economy has been growing. Istanbul is home to media companies and to mechanical engineering, food, leather and clothing manufacturers. Many export their wares all over the world. Some way away from the city center, a new banking district has emerged in recent years. At the crossroads of Europe and Asia, located between Russia and the Middle East and the Mediterranean, Istanbul has become a financial hub of growing importance. It's home to a major stock exchange. There are more than two and a half thousand mosques in Istanbul. Most are in the old districts in the center. They're the most conservative and religious part of the city. These neighborhoods hardly share in the growing prosperity of Istanbul and its new suburbs. People who can afford to do so move away.
Mehmet Selimbaki is an architect and has lived here in Emikapi for many years. When a local school installed a new heating system and no longer needed to store coal in the basement, he came up with the idea of turning that space into a music school. He remodeled the rooms, bought instruments, and engaged music teachers. Parents cook the children lunch. The idea has caught on. Music classes are now held in the basements of four schools in the area. 250 children aged between 7 and 14 learn to play a variety of instruments, the accordion, flute or drums. Some have already won important competitions. Before the music school opened, the children had to leave their regular school around lunchtime. They then had to go home, hang out on the street, or attend a Quran school. These musical afternoons amount to a small revolution. <laughs> On the one hand, we're still living in a secular republic. Music is not exactly forbidden, but there is pressure from the local community. That pressure is real. We feel it all the time, and we try to counter it without provoking any major clashes. We talk to the families concerned and try to come to terms. We constantly have to deal with this issue. Mehmet Selim Baki has named the project Music for Peace. He and his team often discuss with the parents the choice they face, whether to send their children to a Quran school or the music school. A busy and interesting afternoon is a good argument in an area where youth crime and drug abuse are common. <laughs> Mehmet Selimbaki stops by this very special building site every day. He wants music to become a part of people's lives here and he wants musical skills to be passed down through the generations. It was his grandfather who taught him to play the accordion. He says he's fortunate to earn a good income as an architect and wants to use some of that for a good purpose. He set up a foundation to run Music for Peace and this will be its new home, a purpose-built music school in Emikapi. It's an expression of his commitment to Istanbul. In terms of natural beauty, the Bosphorus is unsurpassed. But the mix of cultures here is also very exciting. We've already lost so much, the Greeks have gone and the Armenians. But despite all the losses, what we have here today is also wonderful. A fabulous mosaic of cultures. That's what we're most proud of and what we want to preserve. <laughs> Soon this will be a small concert hall, right in the heart of old Istanbul. A new stone in that cultural mosaic and a contribution to making life here more pleasant. It might help slow the pace of people moving away to what are considered better neighborhoods. Space and land in Istanbul are a battleground for competing interests. Here and there, the city attempts to polish its image. At the same time, uncoordinated growth and urban sprawl continue. What was once considered provisional and temporary becomes entrenched and permanent. 
it's not at all clear which kind of urban development will prevail. Well, I think the increase, the growth in the population has slowed down and uh, Istanbul's uh, social structure is being consolidated uh, much more so than before. It is um, um, less in upheaval, it is less uh, uh, mobile, um, there is more of a consolidation of uh, the rich and the poor and the underclass. And uh, this reflects itself also in the spatial structure of the city in the sense that uh, you know now where the rich people are living and where the poor people are living. And uh, this, uh, of course, there's the risk of uh, this uh, structure leading to uh, a permanent polarization, both in income terms and in space terms. Well, an artist can be pessimist, but a designer must solve, must believe uh, uh, on solving problems. Then, with that uh, optimistic perspective, I can say that this will be achieved in Istanbul. People have been living here for 2,700 years. The next few years will decide whether Istanbul remains a city that encompasses disparate realms, becomes a crossroads and hub of cultures and commerce, turns to the West and to Europe, or perhaps goes its own way as the only mega-city to straddle two continents.